Almighty God, give us grace, we humbly ask that we may cast away the works of darkness and walk in the light and put on the armor of your light. Now in the time of this mortal life, in which thy Son, Jesus Christ, came to out visit us in great humility, that in the last day when he shall come again, in his glorious majesty to judge both the quick and the dead, that we may, like Christ, rise to life immortal through him who liveth and reigneth with thee, and the Holy Ghost, one God, world without end. Amen. Fairest Lord Jesus, ruler of all nature, O thou of God and man the sin, thee will I cherish, thee will I honor, Thou my soul's glory, joy, and crown. We turn to Dr. Emil Brunner's Dogmatics, Volume 1, on the Christian Doctrine of God. We're weighing his writings, published by Westminster Press. Thus far... Uh, we haven't been mightily impressed, expecting more, and we want to be careful and slow in our evaluation. University of Florida, 1853. My goodness. Preface, in the realm of the doctrine of the Christian church is always recognized a twofold task, one concerning the church itself the other concerning the outside world, the world of doubt and unbelief. Although at a time like the present, the conflict with unbelief and false ideologies may seem more urgent, yet the first task is always fundamental. Or how can the church do justice to her missionary calling in an unchristian age if she is not certain and clear about the content of her message? history the Christian church has received and is brown to proclaim this process of reflection is what we call dogmatics. Dogmatics is not the word of God. God can make his prevail in the word prevail in the word without theology. But at a time when human thought is so confused and perverted by fantastic theories and ideas spun out of men's mind, it's evident that it is almost impossible to preserve the divine word without the passionate intellectual effort to rethink its meaning and content. The simple Christian may, it is true, understand and preserve God's word without theology, but for those Christians who are involved in the thinking of their day and who, as children of their own day, are deeply influenced by these currents of thought, an all-inclusive and thorough effort to rethink what has been given to faith is absolutely indispensable. Hence, dogmatics for, serves, first of all, those who themselves exercise a teaching office in the church as clergy and missionaries, evangelists, pastors, and catechists. In addition, is useful to all those members of the Christian church who desire to grapple with the religious problems with their faith, which their faith creates in their own minds. Upon the ladder of reflection, on that which is given with the word of God, dogmatics as the science of Christian doctrine holds pride of place. Hence, it is not everybody's business, but only those who are capable of and need of a thoroughgoing thought. There's no lack of dogmatics works in the church, but the theological renaissance of the past 20 years, he's writing in 1950, we pause, what's this theological renaissance? Again, are we gonna get somebody who creates the need like an advertiser and then sells you a product? Where's the sense of history in that? Maybe he'll clean it up. 
theological renaissance of the past 20 years. 1930 to 1950 is a period of theological renaissance. It has not produced any comprehensive work which expresses the spirit of this renewal. The monumental work of Karl Barth, which in spite of the five weighty volumes which I've already prepared, has not yet covered one-third of the doctrinal material, makes us wonder, even when we take into account the great industry and creative powers of the great theologian of Basel, whether this massive work, in spite of its unusual length, will be able to do justice to all the claims of a comprehensive presentation of Christian doctrine. In any case, there's room for other attempts. One who for 20 years has been lecturing on dogmatics in the usual four terms a year, and so has tried nearly a dozen times to recast the doctrinal matter as a whole, does not need to fear, fear the charge of superficiality when he produces the result of this work of so many years as a whole, having dealt with it hitherto in single monographs as Christology, Anthropology, the Doctrine of the Holy Spirit, and Revelation. Perhaps it is too much to expect that the comprehensive presentation may succeed in overcoming and dispelling prejudices and misunderstandings which have arisen in the course of the last 20 years and have led to controversy on points of detail. Possibly the general movement may achieve results which could not have been reached by the method of a frontal attack. Owing to my long cooperation with the ecumenical movement, I am fully aware both of the needs and the hopes of the world church. Hence, I've been very careful to keep as closely as possible to the external form of dogmatics, to the theological tradition common to the church as a whole. In the main, therefore, I've tried to follow the order of the La Loki Theologici, which from the days of Peter Lombard onwards has formed the framework of Christian dogmatics and was also in all essentials adopted by that master of Reformed theology, Calvin. Over and over again, I have proved that this procedure is fundamentally sound. In order not to overburden the non-theological reader who is willing to make the effort to th think through theological questions, all the more technical historical material has been re relegated to special appendices. This has also had the advantage of enabling me to introduce surveys from the history of dogma, which will meet the needs of students and may perhaps sometimes even be useful to scholars. My thanks are due to Herr Farrar Rockenbach for the index. It is my earnest desire that this work of dogmatics, of which the present volume is the first of three or four, which have already been planned, may help to preserve the knowledge of the divine word and contribute to its expansion in a world which is fainting for lack of it and is in such sore spiritual need. Emil Brunner, Zurich, Lent, 1946, one year after Hitler fell and died. Contents, preface, translators, notes, prolegomena, the basis and task of dogmatics, basically discussion of dogmatics, appendix to the prolegomena, theology, dogmatics, history of dogmatics, authority of scripture, part one, eternal foundation of the divine self-communication. Chapter 12, The Name of God, with an appendix. 
God the Lord with an appendix. 14, the Holy with an appendix. God is love with an appendix. The triune God with an appendix. The problem of the divine attributes. God the Almighty, omnipresence, omniscience, eternity, unchangingness, faithfulness, and righteousness of God. Wisdom and glory of God. Section 2, the will of God. The eternal divine decrees and the doctrine of election. The problem of double predestination with some appendices, including a comment on Karl Barth's doctrine of election. My understanding is everybody's elect in Karl's scheme. And that looks like it. Okay, translators notice. Uh, Prolegomena. Volume one. Just scrolling through some pages here. There we go. The position of dogmatics. Intellectual enterprise, which bears the traditional title of dogmatics, takes place within the Christian church. It is this that distinguishes it from similar intellectual undertakings, especially within the sphere of philosophy, as that is usually understood. Our immediate concern is not to ask whether this particular undertaking is legitimate, useful, or necessary. The first thing we have to say about it is that it is closely connected with the existence of the Christian church and that it arises only within this sphere. We study dogmatics as members of the church and with the consciousness that we have got commission from the church and a service to render to the church due to a compulsion which can only arise within the church. Historically and actually, the church exists before dogmatics. The fact that the Christian faith and the Christian church exist precedes the existence, the possibility, and the necessity for dogmatics. Thus, if dogmatics is anything at all, it is a function of the church. It cannot, however, be taken for granted that there is or should be a science of dogmatics within the church. But if we reverse the question from the standpoint of dogmatics, it is obvious that we would never dream of asking whether there ought to be a church or Christian faith or whether the Christian faith or Christian church have any right to exist at all. Or this question does arise and in our, a day like ours, it must be raised. It is not the duty of dogmatics to give the answer. This is a question for apologetics or aristics. But dogmatics presupposes the Christian faith and Christian church not only as a fact, but as the possibility of its own existence. From the standpoint of the church, however, it is right to put the question of the possibility of and necessity for dogmatics. But when all of this has been said, the place of dogmatics has still only been defined in a very provisional sense. Further, this definition of its place is obliged to start from the fact that the Christian church is a teaching church. But even as the teaching body, the church precedes dogmatics, both historically and actually. From its earliest days, the church, the Christian community, has been preeminently a teaching body. One of our outstanding characteristics has been teaching or doctrine. As the Lord of the church, Jesus Christ was himself a teacher. So also his disciples carry on a teaching ministry. We cannot think of a Christian church without teaching any more than we can think of a circle without a center. 
teaching and doctrine belong to its very nature. But this does not mean that teaching is the beginning and end of the church. Rather, teaching is one of its functions and one of the basic elements of its life. Like the Lord of the church himself, his apostles did not only teach, they did other things as well. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' teaching and fellowship in the breaking of bread and the prayers. This is the earliest description of the primitive church. Whether the teaching is put first intentionally or by accident, we will not as yet inquire. We may, however, guess that the order is not accidental, for there can be no doubt that from the very earliest days and down the centuries, teaching has been an outstanding function and expression of the life of the church. Dogmatics is related to this teaching function of the church, its living basis, its possibility, and as will be shown later on, its content all depend on it. But this teaching of the church is not dogmatics. The apostles are not systematic theologians. <laughs> it's impossible to think without trying to be systematic. What was St. Stephen doing in Acts 7 but collating and coordinating Old Testament talents? Or Paul and his sermons? It's, uh, sorry, Emma. Maybe not the way you like it done, but that there's something in the head that tries to organize the books in the library or place the furniture in the living room or sort out the, the kitchen utensils and where the cups and plates and forks and knives go. That's systematics, trying to have a system in your kitchen. So uh, that's not too good, Emil. Doctrine, to put it so for the moment, is the science of Christian teaching or doctrine. But the subject always exists before the science of the subject. The teaching church and the teaching of the church is the place at which dogmatics arise. But the doctrine of the church and the teaching church do not merely constitute the presupposition of dogmatics in the sense that a subject presupposes the science of that subject. There may be, it is true, a science of Christian faith and Christian doctrine for which that general relation between subject and its science exists, which we might describe as a branch of general religious knowledge, namely as the science of the Christian religion. It was thus conceived by Schleiermacher in his shorter exposition of the relation between the doctrine of church and dogmatics, although he did not adhere to this his own this definition in his own work on the Christian faith. When we said that the church is the place of dogmatics, we meant that this kind of academic and intellectual knowledge or research was only possible within the community of believers. Dogmatics are only possible or thinkable, not only because the church and Christian teaching exist, but also only where they exist. Dogmatics is itself a function of the church. Only one who is a genuine believer and as such believes in the church and its teachings can render to the church the service which is implied in the idea of dogmatics. The presupposition of dogmatics is not only within the church and in its doctrine. Dogmatic thinking is not only thinking about the faith, it is believing thinking. It's a nice point. Very nice point. There may be various ways of solving the problem of the theory of knowledge which this raises. This, in any case, is the claim which dogmatics makes. Without any effort, it ceases to be dogmatics and becomes a neutral science of religion. <coughs> it is the believing church itself 
which in dogmatics makes its own claim, its own teaching, the object of reflection. Essentially, dogmatics claims to be an academic study controlled by the church. And there's a footnote here in Schleiermacher's work, a connected presentation of doctrine as it is accepted at a given time is what we mean by the expression of dogmatics or dogmatic theology, which sounds relativizing. Chapter two, the necessity for dogmatics. The urgent question for humanity, which despairs of all truth, is there any truth which one can believe at all? And if so, does Christian doctrine as such claim to be truth of this kind lies as we have already seen outside the sphere of dogmatics. The Christian church deals with this question by means of an intellectual discipline, which is closely related to dogmatics, yet which must always be strictly distinguished from it. This study is called apologetics, a name which is as traditional as the term dogmatics. Apologetics is the discussion of questions raised by people outside of and addressed mm -hmm. to the Christian church. Therefore, at all times, it has proved to be as urgent and as inevitable as the Christian study of doctrine proper. The question of the justification for and the necessity of dogmatics differs from the former question because it arises within the church. Mm -hmm. And yet it is a genuine and not a rhetorical question, nor is it even merely academic. The fact is this question is justified from the standpoint of the scientific theologian. Serious objections have been raised to the whole undertaking, objections which must be recognized. To ignore them would simply mean that we had already fallen prey to that dogmatic rigidity. The first objection concerns the loss of directness and even the simplicity of faith, which is necessarily connected with the process of dogmatic reflection. I think we're gonna interject here and add the necessity of humility, the necessity of the fear of God the necessity of humble believing. Maybe he'll get around to that. But one of the concerns we have as we do systematic theology is the epistemological, epistemological state, condition of the mind, of the man talking, and the condition of his soul. Something we we're talking about, Bart, that was just not right. We're weighing that. So while he's talking here about this being the reflection in the church of the church teaching office, we certainly we don't want to be pietists now. We want Old Testament exegesis, New Testament exegesis, systematics, church history, which were really not getting some of that here with him. Now, maybe it'll rise in the appendices. Time will tell. But we want to interject this importance of this, pursuing every day, humble, humility, kneeling, bowing the neck. A person who has hitherto only encountered the biblical gospel, only, only, in its simplest form and has been gripped by it in a direct personal way must necessarily feel appalled, chilled, or repelled by the sight of massive volumes of dogmatics and his first acquaintance with the whole apparatus of ideas and of reflection connected with this study of theology as a science. Instinctively, the simple Christian murmurs why this immense apparatus of learning? What is the use of these subtle distinctions and these arid intellectual definitions? 
what is the use of this profit process of vivisection of our living faith? What further this simple believer become, when further this simple believer becomes aware of the theological controversies and passionate dogmatic conflicts which seem inevitable, it is easy to understand that the simple Christian man or woman who turns away from all this with horror, exclaiming, I thank thee, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou didst hide these things from the wise and understanding, and didst reveal them to babes. It's an interesting way to look at it. Verse 2 of Hymn 384. <clears throat> Fair are the meadows, fair are still the woodlands, robed in the blooming garb of spring. <clears throat> Jesus is fairer, Jesus is purer, who makes the soul, woeful soul to sing. Let us pray. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Godspeed.